Please don't you pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts together find their way into the heart of God this morning. Amen. An old friend of mine named Chuck gave all of his money away. I actually told you this story way back in 2017, the day I gave out $5,000 to you in a reverse offering. Do you all remember that day? Well, were some of you there that day, 2017? Raise your hand if you were. Okay. Oh, we've retained some members. <laughs> I gave out $5,000 uh, in a reverse offering and asked you to um, do good with it and then come back and tell the story. That was the whole assignment. It was actually, the stories were amazing. Um, and we spread um, that money all over the place. We, we redistributed wealth. Don't tell um, anyone that we were being socialists that day. <laughs> but anyway, I want to tell you the story again about my friend Chuck. Um, Chuck Collins was 16 years old when his dad sat him down and told him that he was about to inherit so much money he'd never have to work a day in his life if he didn't want to. Chuck was the heir to the Oscar Mayer Wiener uh, fortune. And at 16, a trust fund was to be set up in his name. He lives in Jamaica Plain in Massachusetts. The trust would grow to be several million dollars by the time Chuck was middle-aged. And his father encouraged Chuck to work anyway, as he had, and to not give up who he was or what he wanted to do. Chuck refers to this experience as being born on third base. The money weighed heavily in his pocket. And in his young soul, it felt like both a responsibility and a curse. He knew that he didn't earn it. He knew he didn't deserve it. And he also knew that others needed it far more than he did. And so, at age 26, he took his father's advice of not giving up on who he was and gave every penny of his inheritance away. He gave away every last cent. He gave it to foundations and groups that he knew needed funding, organizations that were working for the environment, for peace, for racial equality, and indigenous people and gay rights. That's the crazy kind of thing we do when we are idealistic in 26, right? <laughs> His father asked him if he was becoming a communist. Chuck answered, no, a Christian. Wealth that just creates more wealth seemed wrong, said my friend Chuck. The decision to give away my wealth felt like the first real decision I'd ever made. He wrote in the We Gave Away a Fortune, life presents only a few crystal clear opportunities to take risks for what you believe, and this was one. Since that day in 1985, Chuck has had a child who is now a beautiful young adult. He bought a home in Jamaica Plain in Boston. He worked tirelessly at the organization he founded in Boston called United for a Fair Economy to create economic justice in the world. He served as one of those indispensable pillars at two churches, one of which I was the intern of. And written several books, including one that he co-authored with Bill Gates Sr. about preserving the estate tax. He has worked with communities on creating financial sustainability for his entire career, promoting the religious value of common wealth. He has never once regretted his decision to give away his inheritance. Chuck took the abundance of what was given to him and has spent his whole life sharing it. He has spent his whole life teaching others how to share it too. I'd like to think that I'd make the same choice as Chuck. Would you? Raise your hand if you would make the same choice as Chuck, if you were the heir to the Oscar Mayer Wiener fortune. <laughs> Nobody's raising their hand? <laughs> oh, okay, Aaron is, yes. <laughs> Hypothetically. <laughs> uh, 
I think I'd probably keep some of that money personally. Um, maybe like, I don't know, like two million of it or something. And I'd like, I'd buy some stuff, like an Apple watch and a lot of clothes and like a, yeah, shoes. Maybe, maybe like a vacation home in Maine. Not in like, not in like Bora Bora, but like Maine. Student loans. Student loans. Well, yeah, I, uh, I, mine were forgiven, so I don't have student loans. But I would pay my kids, I would pay for my kids to go to college. Would you pay for your kids to go to college? I would pay for my kids to go to college. That seems like a good thing to do. I, but anyway, then, then I would give the rest of it away. <sighs> then maybe I hope. Anyway, I'd give the rest of it away. He was 26 when he gave his money away, so maybe he hadn't thought about what it would be like to have kids in a mortgage, and maybe he never dreamed of a vacation home in Maine. I don't know. <laughs> it's an interesting thought experiment, like what would you do, right? But it's one that we can easily remove ourselves from or distance ourselves from. I think most of us don't associate ourselves with wealth or think of ourselves as particularly wealthy. Most of us aren't in the 1%, maybe none of us are. Um, and if we are, like most Americans, we have a complex relationship to wealth. Chuck says in his book, Born on Third Base, the relationship status between us people, er, between US people and our super wealthy is complicated. At one talk I gave, he says, I asked the audience, how many of you feel rage towards the wealthiest 1%? So how many of you feel rage towards the, the wealthiest 1%? Okay, so, so <laughs> some people in the choir are willing to admit it, and they're sitting up in front of everyone. <laughs> okay, Kate, yep, all right. So there's some rage. Almost everyone in a room of 350 people when he gave this speech raised their hand and there was some nervous laughter. How many of you have admiration for some of the things wealthy people have done to make our society better? Yeah, sure, sure. He said about two thirds of the people in the room raised their hands when he asked that question. How many of you wish you were in the wealthiest 1%? He asked, <laughs> okay, okay. Again, almost everyone raised a hand laughing. And he said, so you feel enraged, admiring, and wish to be the object of your own anger. <laughs> he said. <laughs> See, I told you it was complicated. <laughs> Most of us, anyway, are not rich. And many of us approach those we associate with wealth with a mix of rage and admiration and a covetous desire to be in their shoes. And so perhaps we approach today's scripture about the rich young man feeling like we can't relate to the man in the story or wishing we could, maybe both. Here's how the story goes. A rich, very pious and earnest young man says to Jesus, what deed do I have to do to receive eternal life? And Jesus says, essentially, why are you asking me this? Basically, only God is good, he says. And then Jesus says, but if you do wish to enter eternal life, you should keep the commandments. And the young man said to him, which ones? And Jesus says, you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall, you shall, shall not lie, you should honor your mother and father, and also you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And the young man said to him, I have kept all of these. What do I still lack? Like, what else do I do? What do I do next? Which just seems to me like asking for trouble. <laughs> but this young man is maybe idealistic in that 26-year-old kind of way. And Jesus says this thing that is so demoralizing because it feels so totally impossible. He says... If you wish to be perfect, sell all of your possessions, give it all to the poor, and follow me. And the young rich man walks away, completely dejected and grieving because he has so much. 
he has a mortgage and he has children to feed and, and send to college and a timeshare in the Caribbean that he quite likes and he's going to Disney in April because his eight-year-old has been begging for it for years and he has a boat out on Lake Winnipesaukee and he has a motorcycle and he doesn't feel like he can give any of that up, much less all of it, right? Jesus doesn't just tell him to sell all of his possessions, though. He also tells him to redistribute his wealth among the poor to identify with a segment of the population he has probably worked very hard to separate himself from. Perhaps this contributes to the man's grief. The social costs are just so great. It is hard, Jesus says, for a rich man to get to heaven like squeezing a camel through the eye of a needle, he says. The disciples are notably and perhaps rightfully upset by this interaction. Who then will be saved, they demand. Here's a guy who is doing everything he can to be good. He's showing up to church every Sunday. He's volunteering to help host coffee hour. He's reading the Bible. He's going to the Dominican Republic with the medical mission team. He, has, he is kind to all even before he's had his coffee in the morning. He's good to his wife. He's good to his kids. He takes care of his aging parents. He works hard at his job. And he tithes 10% of his salary to his church. And he gives to NPR or the Goodwill or the Salvation Army or IHN or whatever causes he supports to boot. He's foregoing buying that second home so he can do all of these things even. And Jesus says, sorry, that's not enough. You have to give it all away. Let's be honest, Jesus, none of us are going to sell our houses and live in a tent with our kids, and I think we've earned that vacation. I know that I have. And so we are saying with the disciples, exasperated, who can be saved then, Jesus? Who? For mortals, it is impossible, Jesus says, infuriatingly. But with God, all things are possible. Here's the point. We cannot save ourselves. That's impossible. You and I are rich by Jesus' standards, regardless of the size of our bank accounts. We live in the wealthiest country in the world. Our disconnect with real poverty is actually staggering. And on top of that, some of us have quite a lot. And yet, we are not going to sell all of our possessions and redistribute it, them to the poor. Most of us wouldn't, in other words, make the choice that Chuck Collins did, much less go 100% with Jesus. Jesus, in his hyperbole, just wants us to acknowledge that. He wants to show us that we are rich. He wants us to know that if we want an idea of what we actually value versus what we say we value, all we have to do is look at our bank accounts and our calendars and look what we spend our money and our time doing. He wants to show us that we cannot be perfect, that goodness is reserved for God. He wants us to feel the disconnect between our values of building heaven here on earth and where and what we spend our money on, right? Jesus simply wants us to recognize that we are loved despite the fact that we are miserly, despite the fact that perfection is not a possibility. Jesus simply wants us to recognize the hold our possessions have on us and respond to it. So perhaps our response to this dis disconnect is to loosen our white-knuckled grip on our wallets a little bit, or perhaps it is to loosen our white-knuckled grip on our love and who we choose to give it to, because we can't take any of it with us, right? We know that. No one on their deathbed says, I wish I hadn't been so generous, right? I don't think so anyway. Stop being stingy, 
Jesus is saying. With God, everything is possible. With God, the last are first. With God, you are rich in abundance. So give it away. That's what he's saying. Beloved, you and I don't have to be perfect. Only God is perfect. You and I don't even have to be good. Only God is good. You and I are loved anyway. You and I are cherished anyway. Every hair on our heads is counted. You and I don't have to do anything or be anything to earn that love because with God, all things are possible, thank God. But a natural response to this unearned abundance is to give it away. It's to share your pizza. It's to share your donuts. It's to have a party with all that pizza and all those donuts. It's to create community. And don't just give it to causes you support like La Romana and the Deacons Fund and IHM and the Community Lunch. Give it to the church's operating fund because our pledges have failed to fund our budget pretty spectacularly in the last few years. Right, Pat? Yeah. And none of those things will exist if this church closes its doors like so many other churches in this area have closed their doors. Can I get an amen? amen. My friend Chuck felt like his unearned wealth was burning a hole in his pocket, so he gave it all away. Not begrudgingly, but to express his gratitude. It set him free. God's love is similarly unearned. God's love is similarly wasteful, similarly extravagant. It is abundant. It is ours to keep no strings attached. And our response should be to love wastefully and extravagantly in return whenever and wherever we see the need with our wallets, with our bodies, and with every bit of our hearts in every broken and forgotten part of this empire and right here where we live. That love will set us free. Practice giving your love away without strings or expectations, especially with people you find most unlovable. If you want to give your love away effectively, pledge a portion of your money to this church because here your money goes directly toward the things you most deeply value. Come to Eat, Pray, Learn on Wednesday night to learn skills for how to love your immigrant neighbors. Be part of the love revolution. Just go all in. Why not? Life only creates a few opportunities to take risks for what you believe. So take every opportunity you have. Remember who you are and whose you are. Remember to whom you belong and give with everything you have. There is no time but now, no people but us, and no way forward except turning toward each other. Amen. <laughs>